Good afternoon, traders. Welcome to Stock Market Movers, where we give you guys all the headlines that are in the intraday market. What are catching the tape? What's moving the markets? And of course, we get to the expert opinions that you guys want to hear from. Let's dive into today's topics. Today's topics, we're going to talk about, of course, tech dipping with Micron and NVIDIA. CPI report is in the focus. Unity at Love and Ford uh, getting some raises of prices. Arc Kathy Woods buys the dip. We'll talk a little bit about that. Novavac dipping, of course, off of their COVID vaccine demand. Earnings disappointments in Upstart. Take two, Norwegian Cruise Lines and others. We're going to dive in today's show. There's a lot to talk about. Give us a thumbs on up if you're excited to dive in today's show. We got another great one. We got two experts, Adam Johnson, founder and author of Bullseye Brief coming on up, and Greg Milano, a CEO of Fortuna, uh, Fortuna Advisor. Excited to dive into that. We got two guests on for today, and we're ready to get into the show. Welcome to Stock Market Movers with Money Mitch. It's time for Money Making Mitch. When investors need a story, we're going to the moon. Welcome to Money Mitch, where story is everything. I'm here to find you the next opportunity. It's all about the green hands. Now we all know the bull market is here to stay. Money Mitch. All right, traders, let's dive on in and see what we're seeing in the market today. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on out there. Of course, we're seeing the tech drop here. We'll talk a little bit about that. Let's get into the overall market and see where we're at right now. Looks like we're back into the range, and this is kind of what we've been talking about here on Stock Market Movers, that we were looking to see if we were going to get back into the range, right? And now you're seeing it back there towards 411s. Really, I see support closer down here towards 407 and 408. We could leak down there, but as you can see, we've been leaking here from the open. A lot of this coming off the queues. Also, you can see here on the daily, big turnaround from the 325s all the way back towards support now. And now the question is, will tech take that next leg down? Will it do a 50% retracement of the recent move? We'll keep watch to see if we get continued downside in tech, right? It all started with Micron today. And so the question that I think everybody's asking today, will tech take the rally down? And you guys are seeing it already starting to play in the effect here as the spy coming on back down after it kept trying to hold 413. Now really back below there going towards the 410. We'll keep watch to see what happens. Of course, towards the bell, it's going to be something to keep on, on an eye out, but definitely uh, something that I'm watching will tech take this rally right back down. And what did we get today? Well, we got, of course, Micron, right? Micron is the story of the day. Let's talk about that. Micron warning here that its revenues might not even meet the current quarter and actually fall below or near the low end of the recent forecast provided on June 30th. Of course, they gave this forecast already knocking down the expectations, but coming in here and even lowering the bar further here for Micron, definitely going to affect the stock. And one thing that we'll keep on watch will be, will it take down all the stocks, right? NVIDIA did bounce back yesterday. And what did we see in the intraday? Well, Micron tried to do the same. It tried to bounce back there, but what did it eventually do? It leaked right back towards the lows of those pre-market, eventually breaking that 58 and going towards a low here. I have a 57.74. So look today, if we can get back above 59.50, it's not going to look too bad. But if we definitely leak and continuing the leak on Micron, it's going to affect the overall market here. And I think one thing that it's really starting to do is give the excuse to sell here, take the profit and run. That's what I think is happening today. You're seeing a lot of people starting to question, well, I thought, you know, CPI was going to come in light, but the real question is, how light will it come? Should I just run to profits today? Well, I think we're seeing that right now. A lot of people probably taking their chance, 
hitting the red button and saying, I want out of this market because I don't want to stick around to see what happens. And of course, that CPI data. And I think everybody's going to be, of course, watching that to see what happens if people are hitting the red button. And of course, I mean, CPI data is everything this week, right? I mean, the expectations are for it to dip to 8.7 from a July's high of 9.1. So I'll throw out these current scenarios, right? What are the scenarios that could happen? Well, if we come in, let's say below 8%, what would happen there? Inflation really peaking there and showing us that. What would happen? I think the Fed comes out and says, well, there you guys see it. Did you see what we did? We knocked down inflation. Really, of course, it's coming on down with the prices of oil. But I think everybody's trying to call their shot, right? And I think the Fed would definitely love to call their shot if they saw CPI head down below that 8%. Now, what if it comes in line? What if it comes in at 8.7, right? The estimate at 8.7 from a high of 9.1. Well, then, you know, we went down from 9.1. But did we come down fast enough in the inflation data to really show that inflation has truly peaked and heading on the downward path. I think this is something, another scenario to keep in mind. And then what would happen if we come in hot? Let's say we come in at 9% and we only see a 0.1% from those highs in July. Well, then of course you'll see the Fed probably stay on the, the hawkish path and then really start looking at more than, let's say the 50 basis points really starting to price in more of that 75 basis points hike rate in September. We'll keep an eye out to see what happens, but definitely CPI data this week is going to be everything to watch. Of course, that comes out at 8.30 tomorrow, so catch it as it hits live on pre-market prep. Of course, I'll be there to kind of go over it. Let's get out of the CPI data. Let's go towards the next major headline that definitely shook up a lot of the market this morning was Unity. Um, I don't know if you guys caught that with app loving. Let's take a look at Unity. It was spiking right before the bell here. You guys can see that big spike on Unity. It pushed up there all the way to about 57, then pulled back all the way to 49 here. Now it's looking like it's catching a little bit of the bid. We'll keep watch on Unity as it's pulled back almost to the support there. It was interesting to find this news. App Loving submitting a compelling non-binding proposal to combine with Unity here, and it would be payable in a mix of App Loving Class A and Common C uh, Common Stock, and it would value Unity at fifty-eight dollars and eighty-five. Uh, cents per share and a 20 billion enterprise value of course this was a proposal we haven't gotten the answer if this is going to actually go through and pretty big move off of a proposal there the algos jumped all over this one unity is one that i've been watching since it's been giving these kind of bottoming effects right you could see it here when it first gapped down it was kind of a disaster here and you could see that it tried to come back into this level to this 30 couldn't do it. That is the level that I'd call as real support here at 35. Now you're seeing it get on up there. If it could get back towards the 45 and 40s, this might be one that I start dipping my toes in. But something that I'll keep on watch is, of course, Unity Software. All right, let's get out of Unity Software. What other stock do we want to talk about today? Well, did you guys catch Ford raising their price on the Ford F-150 Lightning? Let's go towards this one. I definitely saw this one as a little bit of a short opportunity today when I saw Tesla start dropping immediately. And it looks like it would have been a nice one. But let's talk a little bit about this. The starting price of the 2023 Ford one F-150 Lightning will now range from about 47000 to 97000 up about 6000 and 8000 1500 depending on the model. They're increasing the prices. Of course, this is due to what? supply chain issues right and how they needing to probably pay up a little bit more for the materials needed for this ev f-150 lightning now the thing to keep watch i think is look at the auto manufacturers and and kind of watch this has made a huge run recently and it's been up about what 40 42 percent just like a lot of the stocks you can take a look at but now we're starting to see what tesla come back a little bit into shape here right and so I'm looking for a 50% retracement move in Tesla. It's gone from around 
up there towards a high of 94082s, coming on back now towards 844s. We'll see if it gets towards that 50% retracement. And I think the same thing for Ford. I would take a look there and I would just draw a retracement here up there from those highs. And you can see here, that would actually put us back here closer towards that 1360s coming on back down. We'll see if it actually gets all the way back down there. But Ford is one definitely turning around today and raising the price of that EV F-150 Lightning. Of course, Ford does have access to those EV credits that could help bring those prices down a little bit on the tax side. But it's still expensive, right? I don't know about you guys, but 47000 on the low end seems pretty high to me. I don't think I want to be buying the Ford F-150 Lightning anytime soon. But we've seen the Ford F-150 prices just skyrocket, right? We'll continue to see how, uh, how they're able to actually sell this vehicle. Let's get out of Ford raising the EV pricing in a second. We'll jump into our first interview with Adam Johnson. I want to really quickly talk about Kathy stepping up and buying the dip in NVIDIA. Um, there you guys see Kathy stepping on up there. I didn't expect to see this, but of course, uh, they stepped up here and bought 366,982 shares of NVIDIA Corporation, valued over $51 million based on Monday's closing price. Um, and they added it to three different ETFs. And as you can see, it headed right back down there today. And uh, a little part of me confused, right? Why take it on the first day of bad news? Did they expect it to come immediately up? I'm not sure on that end. But definitely, they're probably down on this position based on the closing price, especially um, you can see it cut through the lows of yesterday. So I'm wondering, you know, was this a good buy in NVIDIA? I can't blame her for it to to go ahead and get after this one. But where will it go from here? At least from what I see on the daily, it looks very bearish, like it's wanting to head down back towards the 160s. We'll see if it breaks down here through the 165. And of course, Kathy didn't stop here with NVIDIA. She bought some Twilio. Um, so let's take a look really quickly at Twilio. You can see it's heading down also. And she also bought some TDOC. Um, so TDOC also showing a little bit of topping. It didn't look like any of these had instant reactions to the upside. Um, and major sales coming in, of course, Signify. Uh, we talked about this with the rumor. She took that rumor and said, you know what? I'll take it when I can get it. Sold 994,801 shares of Signify help here and also got rid of the DraftKings. Uh, she might have been listening to my NFL outlook and uh, definitely – it got up there. DraftKings definitely took off from that 1380s that we were trading it last week. But turning around here now back down below that 1841, I'm calling that as resistance right now. You can see a couple of wicks there, but everything failing when, once it got back to that. Now you're seeing it back there towards 1766. She sold 852,851 shares of DraftKings. She also started selling Fate, which showed me that I could be watching the biotech starting to turn around and we're seeing them start coming on back down. She also had Beam, uh, which Beam Therapeutics, you can see it also coming on down, and CRISPR, of course, one of another Kathy favorite, as you're starting to see some of these biotechs turn around. Maybe this was also due to the guidance given by Novavax, but as you can see, these biotechs that were really strong starting to turn around a little bit. Let's get out of the Kathy names. Let's go ahead and dive into our first interview of the day. I'm excited to go ahead and bring back Adam Johnson, one of the best, most optimistic uh, analysts that I find out there. And what I like about that is let's just think about it, right? Overall, if you stay optimistic about the markets, that is probably going to do you well in the long run, right? At the long run, at the end of the day, markets do come on up. And so I love always an optimistic outlook. Let's dive in with Adam Johnson, founder and author of Bullseye Briefs. I'm going to put a quick trailer and we'll bring on Adam Johnson here. If you guys got a question that you guys want to ask Adam, feel free to drop it in the chat on the right. I tell all my CEOs, this is a very, very, very important platform. And look, all the other platforms are important too, but you're up there now. You're way up there. 
best investments you can do in your future is actually go and 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 uh, re-educate yourself on on credible sites, incredible resources like uh, like Benzinga. I think you guys have been killing it. The comment section on this show is remarkable. Like like the quality of the combo and just big shout out to you and your community. So I love about you guys. You know, you just had the, all your callers in right then. And it's all about the community here at Benzinga. All right, let's go ahead. Let's bring on Adam Johnson, founder and author of Bullseye's Brief. And I definitely tell you guys, check it on out if you haven't done so before or not following Adam, definitely do so. I always love his little walk through Central Parks or wherever Adam is in New York. So if you guys haven't seen those, just check one out and you tell me if you don't like it. Oh, How thanks, you- Adam. Great to be with you. Thanks, Mitch. I appreciate the plug. I do love doing those walk and talks. I actually did one this morning uh, right out in front of the office. And I'm, I'm here on 6th Avenue in the 50s. I'm right in the thick of it. And, um, you know, it feels good. Um, whether whether you, whether you want to call me an optimist or, uh, or, or a guy who's just trying to uh, make money for subscribers, um, you know, it's what I do. I live and breathe this hey, stuff. Hey, maybe those go hand in hand, right? Um, one of the things that we always want to take a look at is being optimistic. But Adam, I have to ask you really quickly, how do you see New York? Is it back, like fully back? Because I know you would know. Well, I'll tell you what, um, tourist-wise, it's totally back. But um, curiously, mm-hmm. professional-wise, it's not. Um, In fact, my building uh, right now, the occupancy is running about 47 percent. And that's pretty typical for the city as a whole Um, under 50 percent. Right. So people really aren't back. I know it's summer. And so if you were going to try to work from home, uh, summer would be the time to do it. Um, But what's really curious, Mitch, there's just such a great energy as you walk around the city and you see all these tourists, Um, the restaurants. Good luck getting a table. I mean, you can't get a table. Um, Broadway is packed every night. Um, the museums, I live up near the Metropolitan Museum, uh, which is at like, you know, 80th and 5th and, um, lines snaked out front every Saturday and Sunday. So, um, it feels good. We we've waited a long time for this. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I know that a lot of people are probably glad to hear that and back to real normal and it's important to have. Now let's talk about your picking stocks, right? Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is how do you go about this, Adam? How do you think, do you, do you take a look at fundamentals? Is it technical? Is it a story? What is it for you, Adam? Well, for me, it's always the story. I'm a thematic investor. And so I think themes matter. Uh, My big overarching theme is American ingenuity, the people and companies driving the world forward. Uh, In practical terms, that can mean artificial intelligence. It can mean uh, robotics. Um, It can mean um, uh, a software company. It can mean a transportation company. It's it's anything that is is doing something different. XPO Logistics, splitting into two, less than truckload operations, and effectively turning uh, truckers' iPhones into basically the Uber of freight, where truckers can bid on freight in the same way that Uber drivers can bid on passengers. That's pretty innovative. I think that's pretty exciting. By the way, that stock is pretty cheap. Um, you were talking about NVIDIA earlier, the world's fastest chips. Um, I know the stock is down. I think this is actually a pretty interesting place to buy it. It um, on a uh, PE um, basis is about as cheap as it gets. It's down around 30 times. And I know that's cheap or a lot more expensive than the market. But when you're talking about a company that typically grows 40, 50 percent and makes the fastest chips in the world, um, it should trade at a premium. So, you know, I look for three things, Mitch. Um, I look for a great story. That's the thematic investor in me. I look for data that supports the thesis. That's the analyst in me. And then I look at um, or try to find some sort of newsy hook, um, something that we're all kind of talking about. And I guess that's that's probably uh, the person in me. Right. Um, you know, just as you like to to interact with people on the show, I enjoy interacting with all my subscribers and, and trying to figure out what we're talking about, um, what other people are talking about. So, um a great story, data that supports the thesis, and some kind of newsy hook. Those are the three things I look for. If it's an American ingenuity kind of story and I find those three, three things, I write it up as a bullseye pick, put it in the portfolio. Love it. I love the idea and how you're taking different variables there into your strategy, not just one piece of the pie, but trying right. to put it together. And I think it's an important thing. I always approach it as the stories, technicals, and fundamentals, but I think those can play right into those. So if you guys 
This is what I always talk about, strengths and weaknesses, right? Try to pull from different traders their strengths and weaknesses so that you can apply it to your own strategy. Let's start diving into it. You just talked about NVIDIA. What do you think about the recent warnings with Micron? I mean, the second time coming on in here, giving us lower expectations. How do you see tech overall? Well, I'll tell you, let's just stick with NVIDIA for the moment while we're on it. Um, If you're analyzing the NVIDIA business, you have to look at two different components. Um, You have to look at data center, which is about two thirds of the revenues. Um, And then you have to look at gaming, which is about the other third. Now, gaming revenues were down. Um, and that arguably, if you look year over year is, is because you had fewer people locked up at home. They're coming back to New York as we're just talking about. Uh, but if you look at data center, that was up 44%, or, you know, year over year, how many businesses do you know growing 44% year over year? So while we can talk about just raw processing power with AMD, um, with NVIDIA, you're talking about very specialized chips. 3 trillion calculations per second. You know, so if you're you're playing a game and you know you walk past a wall and you see your reflection in that wall, right? You know, and then you turn down the alley and you see something else, every single one of those pixels is 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 recalculating as you're walking down that alley and that's how you're able to get those incredibly realistic graphics um, that that come across the screen at every moment. Only NVIDIA's chips are capable of three trillion calculations per second. Um, so, I, you know, I think NVIDIA is 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 a must own stock. I applaud Kathy for buying it. Um, I own it. Um, it's in the bullseye portfolio, and I think that's one that that um, you know when 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 it's down, you buy it. You're looking for discounts on a, a stock like that. And one of the things that I would always play into it is that if we are going to keep moving forward in the gaming industry, the computer com, uh, computing power that we see nowadays, I mean, NVIDIA is probably going to be in the forefront of that. So something definitely to keep in mind in the story and, there. Yeah. And by the way, Mitch, you know, you're talking about Unity Software getting that kind of weird bid. It was like an unsolicited, yeah. non-binding letter. Uh uh, from Applovin, um, that's a little odd. It's almost, it's like we've gone back to the eighties, right? With a tender <laughs> offer or something. But, you know, I love the fact that there um, is a company out there that wants to buy Unity, by the way, a bullseye pick. Um, so, you know, that to me shows interest. It, it it shows that people are paying attention. Last week, we had three big mergers um, in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, Big Pharma buying Little biotech, because as we know, little biotech got way too cheap. Uh, You look at the 400 stocks in the XBI, which is the biotech index, 40% of them, Mitch, trading at a discount to cash. Now, I know you could say, yeah, but biotech is spending cash. They have a cash burn rate. Okay, fine. So the cash isn't going to sit there. But 40% trading at discount cash, that has never happened in the history of biotech. So my point is, whether you're talking about big pharma looking at biotech and finding opportunities, or whether you're talking about um, app love and looking at Unity software at finding opportunities, or whether you're talking about a Kathy Wood saying, hang on, NVIDIA on the cheap. The point is so many stocks have come down so far, and actually you're starting to see growth and value merge. The growth stocks have come down to a point where they actually become value stocks. That's definitely the interesting uh, topic there to talk about, because one of the things that we we're talking about why did these stocks come down? We're based on valuations, right? Now, if we're coming into play where, yes, it's it's coming into where investors feel that the valuations are meeting up and we're seeing some companies taking some buying opportunities like you're just mentioning, it's something that we're all going to keep on watch because that's what's probably really going to determine the bottom, right? When we start really meeting those fair values and growth will come back roaring. And Um, and by the way, you just said something very important. That's what determines the bottom. When you have real buyers, I'm not talking the day traders who happen to look at a chart and say, oh, the ISR, the RSI went below 20. Okay, fair point. You might make a a point or two, but that's not real buying. Real buying is when companies come in and say, I want to own that company. I want to buy the whole thing. Or when you have a BlackRock or when you have the Tiger Cubs over with Julian Robertson saying, I'm going to take a 5% position in that company. Um, uh, you know, look at look look at what happened uh, with PayPal, where you've got an activist investor coming in and taking five percent last week. That's real buying, and that is what creates bottoms. Excellent. Now I'll even skip the bottoming question because it's like always, it's going to just be a question of process, and it's never going to be a one stop bottom. But let's go right. into more of what would it take on the CPI reading to really turn the Fed 
and make them more in a dovish stance. I don't think, Mitch, that they necessarily are going to make that pivot on on just one month's data. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, I think they're going to look at uh, the trend over three months. Um, three month moving averages is is something that the Fed likes to talk about, um, and I think that's a, a very thoughtful approach. And and you know, intuitively makes it makes more sense than just you know a single data point. But you know, you were talking about both CPI and PPI earlier. We get all those data points later this week. There are really eight data points: four and four, um, Wednesday and Thursday, um, between the PPI and CPI, and. I think six of the eight are actually, or maybe seven of the eight are expected to decline. And actually by some, you know, pretty notable magnitudes, which jibes with what we're hearing from some CEOs about supply chains normalizing. And I think also the bond market is telling us effectively um, forecasting that inflation is a rear view mirror thing. And I say that because it was back in June and here we are in August. It was back in June that the uh, 10 year went up to 350 and has since backed off to 275, 280, who knows where you market on a given day or a given moment. But you know that's a big move from 350 back down into the, uh, the twos. So I think the bond market is telling us what the Bureau of Labor Statistics is gonna be telling us this week. And that is that we've seen peak inflation. Now, one thing of course that affected this was the oil prices coming on down. Now, one yeah. thing I'm looking at is where does oil prices really start finding some stability? Do you feel that there's a price around here that we'll see mm -hmm. some st st stability come into play? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I, I say that speaking as a former oil trader, um, which I absolutely love doing. Uh, years ago, I traded jet fuel and heating oil. And um, Mitch, the cure, as they say in, in the oil markets for high prices is high prices. So when uh, oil ran up to 125, 130, every producer in the world tried to figure out how to get barrels to the surface. And admittedly, it's not as easy as just flipping a switch. You can do that with nat gas. You can't do it with the oil. Uh, that's because oil is a liquid and liquid is, 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 is much more difficult to manage than gas. But the point is, um, uh, we've lost 5 million barrels of exports from Russia. They're still producing um, uh, oil for domestic consumption. Some is going out, but basically the free world um, has lost 5 million barrels a day of Russian uh, exports. And the world consumes about 90 to 92 million barrels a day. So about 5%. But guess what? We're seeing marginal barrels appear from Iran. Uh, we're seeing marginal barrels appear from uh, Venezuela. Um, as the uh, Biden administration starts to loosen up some of the um, uh, drilling permits here, we're seeing some incremental production out of the US. I mean, every barrel is profitable above 100. And that's why I mean, the cure for high prices is high prices. You take prices high enough and people are going to start pumping. And that's why you have oil now coming back down into the 90s. So to answer your question, where is equilibrium? I think it's somewhere in here in the 90s. You take it down to 80, 85, you'll shut off some of that production that came up. Uh, but you take oil back above 100. And again, you bring that incremental production back on. I think somewhere in the 90s is equilibrium. And I will say that if we saw some sort of um, almost sounds weird to say this, but some sort of off ramp um, in Ukraine where the hostilities were ratcheted back, I think you would probably see um, oil drop another 10 or 12 bucks and maybe even tag into the 70s. Again, there's a lot of marginal supply coming on the markets. Interesting note there. And I feel like this is not the first time I'm hearing this more and more of the supply really being out there, whether it might not be from Russia more supply coming online and of course everybody trying to pump as much on the high prices as they can now okay. let's get into the last couple two i'm going to go into some kind of the bullseye picks here and of course uh, i see in the chat a lot of people asking about them if you want to know more definitely go on his website reach out to adam he'll definitely do so and he loves talking to his subscribers so if you out there want to dive on in with adam Go ahead and reach on out. Now, I want to talk about Palo Alto. I did see that one here. Uh, where are levels you like and why Palo Alto? Yeah, I like it down in here. Um, and, and I like it quite simply because it is the uh, largest cybersecurity provider um, in the country. Uh, I mean, you, you've pulled up the chart right there. And, you know, sometimes a chart can tell a wonderful story. And I think this one does. This is an area where consistently around 500 bucks, um, the stock has found support. Um, 
there are so many high quality companies like Palo Alto that um, have been hit so hard. And I think unfairly, um, earnings growth is still very strong. I think if you put just a standard multiple, um, historic multiple, 10 year average multiple on uh, earnings for 2025, you very comfortable get up into the uh, 700s on the name. Now, you might say, well, hang on, from 500 to 700, isn't that much? Well, you know what? Actually, uh, I'm pretty content owning a relatively uh, unvolatile stock with uh, tremendous earnings visibility, an outstanding management, and a track record of success with, by the way, double-digit growth in a sector that uh, is only getting larger. Uh, cybersecurity is an $85 billion um, uh overall market and uh, Palo Alto consistently ranks number one in those Gartner um, sort of magic quadrant uh, rankings, consistently number one across the board, whether you're talking uh, firewall apps, whether you're talking AI assisted overall um, insurance for people's um, websites. So I think Palo Alto is, is, is very exciting in here. I think this is a tactical buy. So this is one of the new bullseye um, picks. Every week I put out a new pick for my bullseye subscribers. Um, and um, it's a lot of work. People think I'm crazy for trying to pick a new stock every week, but I think that's part of the discipline. And I always say where I want to buy it and where I want to um, sell it. I always sell half when a name gets to uh, the target. And I think that's just, um, that's just good analyst discipline. So uh, yeah, Palo Alto joins the bullseye network this week. That just shows process in my eyes. So the last one I'll ask about is a favorite. We get so many retail traders in our audience and they all a lot. I mean, majority of them love SoFi. And so let's talk yes. a little bit about what SoFi, what did you see in the recent earnings report and what should we watch on this stock? Okay, several things for you. First of all, the recent earnings, very strong, um, led by the fact that SoFi, um, if you recall a few months ago, was able to uh, secure a bank charter. So mm -hmm. it's now a bank, which means it can fund itself with deposits. It doesn't just have to issue bonds or go out and sell stock. That's huge. And that does a lot for the profitability if you can fund yourself with low cost deposits. So that's a, a big plus. Um, they are writing more loans uh, than they ever have. Uh, and they, by the way, are no longer dependent upon student loans uh, the way they were three to four years ago. Student loans are now only about 15 percent of overall revenues. People punished SoFi when um, the Biden administration said, oh, we're going to basically going to forgive student loans. SoFi was the go to short for the shorts. No longer uh, an acceptable thesis because, again, student loans are such a small part of the um, pie. And then two things that you should follow um, with regards to the flow on the stock. Number one, uh, Anthony Noto, the CEO, has bought half a million shares since March. Imagine going to your wife and saying, sweetheart, I'm going to take some of our, excuse me, your money, and I'm going to go buy more stock in the company where I already work, where we already own stock, where we already get our paycheck. You know, the wife's probably saying, really, you're going to, you're going to put even more eggs in that one basket? And he's doing it. And when you yeah. see a CEO uh, put that kind of money behind um, his or her own stock, that's incredibly bullish. The fact that... Um, as we found out today that uh, SoftBank is going to sell a portion of its uh, shares. That may put some selling pressure on the stock near term, but you want to buy it. Um, SoftBank is selling because it's getting redemptions and liquidations and they keep losing key people. Um, that has nothing to do with SoFi. SoftBank's selling a lot of stocks. SoFi is only one of them. So that's an opportunity to buy. I love SoFi. That is a bullseyebrief.com uh, pick and has been uh, for a long time. It's uh, well off the lows. It's an exciting company, Mitch. Yeah, not a bad thing to see after earnings to see uh, your CEO step up or right before it step up to the plate. So yes. it's a good thing to keep an eye out for. Appreciate you coming on. Like always, Adam Johnson, founder and author of Bullseye's Brief. I definitely tell you guys to check it on out. And if not, just do the follow. Just the follow itself will give you guys so much information and opportunity to catch Adam's wisdom. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Mitch. All right, let's go ahead. Let's get out of that. I hope you guys enjoyed us talking a, a range of topics, not only what he sees out there, but also how he goes about it. I think that's always so important because we all want to learn process, right? I mean, I, we can go into a topic, but there's nothing like learning process from someone that's doing this 
with probably a lot more than what we're doing right now as retail traders. So I appreciate Adam coming on, talking about how he looks at his picks. And of course, talking about NVIDIA there and the opportunities. We also talked about what it would take to take the Fed to go dovish. And I think that's always an important thing to look into. And take a look at that oil talk. I think that was a great conversation on supplies. Honestly, maybe you rewind that and watch that all again. It was just that good. All right, let's go into some other topics out there. Out of our first interview, let's go towards what else is moving out there right now. Let's take a quick peek at the overall market, see where we're at now. Um, looks like we're trying to cut back down there towards the 410 uh, 50 level here you guys see the spy trying to cut right back down there we'll see if it gets below that 410 50 by the end of the show of course when we started this show we were right at around the 410 75 we got up a little bit let's see what happens now all right getting out of of course we talked about uh, kathy woods now let's go into what was hot and what was not this is my favorite segment where we talk about what is moving out there and we take a look at sector and industry analysis. Let's go ahead. Let's dive on in. All we got to do is just stick right here. All right. Let's take a look at the change from percentage change since open daily is what I always pay attention to. Reason why is I want to pay attention. How did we trade from the open? Utilities here leading us on up. And what was up in utilities? Well, it was to note the only sector that was actually up from the open, but now energy joining it again. And this is what I was expecting, but let's talk, let's talk a little bit about this. First utilities, then we'll get into energy. Utilities is the only sector that I saw for a little while up past energy. And what was moving us up? Well, let's take a look at some of the bigger players here. And so if you take a look here, it was stocks like Nextera Energy, getting us a nice little push. Duke, Nice little push on up there. Let's see if it gets back through that 110 level that is important to get through. If we can get through that 110 level, I think we can start making our way back towards 112. It's going to be an interesting level to watch. And you can see a lot of wicks, a lot of buying support there at the 109s and the 108s. We'll see if it gets back up through the 111s. Uh, you got Southern Company, Dominion Energy, and then Excel is another one that I was looking for to get to 75 today. Almost there, almost there, guys. Um, we start, We talked about this one early on. Uh, even on live trading, we were looking at it get through the 74.25. Talked about a move up towards 75. Doesn't look bad right now. Up about 1.35 Excel Energy. All right, let's go into some uh, energy plays. And of course, energy plays getting a nice little lift here. Let's take a look at Oxy. Why am I taking a look at Oxy? Because of course, Berkshire Hathaway upped its stake in the oil giant to, to over 20%, no longer needing to talk to us about it here now that he has that 20%. And I, we were looking at this one on the daily. I remember when it got back down there towards the 57, we were wondering, was Warren stepping up again? And it looks to us that, yes, he stepped up into that area. Getting back up there to 62s is Oxy. And you can see ExxonMobil also trying to make its way back. Chevron making its way back. Conoco Phillips also trying to get back there. I actually like that Conoco Phillips chart. If it can get back up above 100, that one actually might take lead uh, in front of the Exxon Mobil for me, at least for tradable uh, oil stocks here. But I'm going to keep watch to see what happens here. Definitely a good day there for energy, getting that bounce back. Maybe it's not a good thing overall for us. Um, but I was watching also gush to see how it was going to hold. Was it going to come back and rip? As you can see, it came on down big. Stopped probably everybody out on it. And we'll see if it's going to come back up and close into the green. All right, what was not hot here, guys? Let's take a look at what was not hot. Of course, you can take a look. Consumer cyclical down big. You can see it here from the sector chart. Sector chart just continuing the leak there in consumer cyclical. What was down the most? Well, it was luxury goods. Why was luxury good down? Well, a lot of it coming off of Signet. And let's talk a little bit about what Signet hit the news here. So Signet Jewelry said Tuesday that they would acquire online jewelry retailer Blue Nile for $360 million in an all in uh, in an all cash deal. And so I think this is important to note because it's something definitely that you you see um what they wanted to state is they were trying to get more into the wedding business. 
And, you know, Signet Jewelers is just not, you know, the way that it used to be. Now, one thing with Blue Nile, right? Blue Nile is an online retailer of kind of jewelry, high-end jewelry. Let's say whether it be maybe it's wedding rings or something like that. And so that's one thing that I'm starting to note in jewelry, just to kind of state the story in here. I think online jewelers are actually doing 10 times better than they used to be. That's why I think you saw Signet step up to the plate here with an online jewelry retailer like Blue Nile. I know I've used an online jewelry retailer when I got my engagement ring for my for my wife. And I, I think that this is definitely a change that happened. And maybe it happened and got pushed forward by the pandemic that online jewelry retailers are actually going to take the forefront now something to keep watching of course it helps them cut the cost but signet stepping up to the plate 360 million in an all cash deal for blue nile we'll see how that affects that but you can see here some of these other stocks really just got hit hard on this even movado a lot of the luxury goods getting hit hard yesterday we saw a lot of department stores strong macy's giving it up today also kss uh, you got Dillard's straight down today. Even though they were bouncing back yesterday, you could see it here from the Dillard's chart. It was coming on up. Yep, it leaked on all that gain and more. Now they're starting to cut down below uh, yesterday's low. We'll see if Dillard's continues to the downside and what happens in these department stores. Technology also taking a major hit. And where did it take the hit? Of course, semiconductors. This is why I was trading Sox S yesterday. Hope that somebody traded SOCKS today. As you guys can see, that takeoff, of course, this is a three-time leverage uh, semiconductor bear uh, chart there, and it really took off. It didn't give me a chance to get in it today. I played it yesterday for a little bit of a run, but look at it up now up there towards 43, not having a bad day there. And a lot of that, of course, coming with the Micron and NVIDIA knocking tech down. Healthcare right behind that and basic materials. Healthcare, I'm starting to notice the turnaround in biotechs. This has been a really strong area that has been pushing for a significant amount of time. Now we're starting to see a little bit of a turnaround. Doesn't mean that all biotechs are turning around, but I definitely am starting to note when I see a stock like Moderna down 7%. That gives me a really quick sign that the rotation might be coming back into play here and going away from these healthcare stocks as you're seeing this retrace from Moderna's nice breakout. And this was a nice setup. It broke out, but now coming on back, we'll see what happens in Moderna. You also saw BNTX take a big hit and a lot of this coming off of Novavax, right? Novavax really uh, bad earnings and demand for its COVID vaccine knocking it down big, and it tried to bounce back a little bit, but couldn't really hold on any bounce back. We'll see what happens on Novavax. All right, let's get out of what was hot and what was not. It's looking like today, I might not be able to get through all my headlines today. This might be a first for here, and I'll tell you one thing. That just means that we have a lot to talk about, and we're going to continue going through it here. Next up, we got our next interview coming right on up. We got Greg Milano, CEO of Fortuna Advisors. I'm excited to dive on into here. We're going to talk a little bit about Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act, and we'll get into talk on buybacks, why it's important or what this exercise tax on stocks buyback would do for investors. So stick around, traders, as we dive into our next interview here right after a quick Benzinga Pro trailer. Introducing Portfolio Synchronization with your brokerage. Now you can securely connect your brokerage account to Benzinga Pro, opening a world of personalization. Screen lightning fast news just for the stocks you own. Set alerts for news catalysts that affect only the companies you care about. It's all possible with a simple click and a secure protective connection. Overcome uncertainty and connect your portfolio to Benzinga Pro today. All right, traders, let's dive on in and bring on here Greg Milano, CEO of Fortuna Advisors. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks for having me on. Excited to go ahead and dive on in. I know that you are, are probably one of the best to talk to about this. How do you feel about the Inflation Reduction Act? And what does the exercise tax on stock buybacks do for investors? 
Yeah, I think the 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 part of the act that I'd like to really focus on is the buybacks because the buybacks I think are the uh, the potential really misstep I think um, on on the part of the the the, um, the leaders in Washington. Mm -hmm. Buybacks serve a really important purpose. Uh, they allow us to recycle capital from older, more mature uh, companies that really don't have enough good investment opportunities to reinvest it all back into the business. Very often, those companies generate a lot of cash flow. They just don't have a lot of things to do with the cash flow. By allowing buybacks and not restricting them in any way, and any, of course, any tax that we put on something tends to make less of it happen, that capital can be sent back to investors who can then reinvest it in the, you know, the next round of Apples and Amazons, the up and coming more entrepreneurial companies that are, are usually capital starved and need money. Uh, and so, you know, this recycling of capital that buybacks allows for is, is just a great way to sort of fuel the economy and a, a great way to grow jobs over time. Now, of course, buybacks did hit a record in the first quarter of $281 billion and started slowing down in the second quarter. Do you think this trend will pick back up or will it continue to slow down? Well, I think a little bit um, uh, uh, of background might be helpful before I straight out answer that. Uh, companies do a very poor job of timing their buybacks. If you if you wanted to do the best thing for your long run shareholders, you would want to buy back more shares when the stock price is low and fewer shares when it's high. And then in total over a five year period, let's say you would buy back more shares because you'd be buying them when they're cheap. It's, you know, it's just the buyback application of buy low and sell high. Um, unfortunately, companies mostly do the exact opposite. They tend to buy back more shares when the price is high when they have a lot of cash flow and a lot of confidence and they don't have the resources or the, the willingness to buy back shares when it's low. So they wind up buying fewer shares than they otherwise would because they're focused on buying them when they're, when they're peaking. And so uh, this is, this year we're just seeing another example of, of that happening. Uh, you know, record buybacks until the market starts to you know drop meaningfully when it bottomed in June, people became concerned. They reduced their buybacks. Now, you know, we all know that it's better to buy things when they're cheap. And just when the, the share prices fell, I mean, the, the indexes were down around 20% at the time is when people really slowed up on their buybacks. So what we're seeing is not that unusual, but what I would expect if I extrapolate that thinking depends on what happens to the market. If the market bounces back as it has been since June and, and it looks like it's you know possible, then I would expect buybacks to resume. If instead, you know, this has just been a, a sort of quick bounce and we return to the market falling to more like the kinds of declines we saw in the financial crisis or at the end of the internet bubble, uh, then I would expect that buybacks would be would be curtailed. Just when they could buy back shares cheap and buy back a lot more shares, uh, the normal human behavior we see from the managements tends to be that they stop buying back then. And we, so we would expect a decline. Now let's go diving a little bit more into some of the kind of fundamentals and, and doing some reports. Why is it important to know how to kind of look into balance sheet forecasting? How could this help investors? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's important. Um, it's, when you want to understand the performance of a company, you need to look at a few key drivers. And we think it's best to have a way of combining those drivers. Uh, you want to look at the growth of a company, of course, you want to look at the profit margin of the company or the cash earnings margin, but you also want to look at how much capital it takes in order to produce that growth in those earnings. And you know, there are many ways to do that. There are very uh, traditional return on capital, return on equity type measures that can be used. But like most percentage measures, they only tell you part of the story. They tell you quality, but they don't tell you quantity. The most successful companies are able to grow, put more capital to work, at a high return on capital, a return on capital higher than the investor's sort of required return or cost of capital. And, and so you need a measure that kind of brings all that together. And it, that kind of a measure can be used internally to decide, uh, should I be reinvesting back into my business? In other words, do I have opportunities to invest in growth that earns a return above my cost of capital? And when I don't have enough opportunities to use all my cash flow to do that, that's when the capital deployment choice should be to distribute more to investors. Uh, dividends and buybacks are both useful ways to do that. Uh, I tend to like dividends more because it doesn't matter how you time them. They treat all the share shareholders the same way. Uh, but if it's uh, a, a non-sustainable cash flow, like let's say in the energy industry, where you're not sure you're going to have the current kind of oil prices forever, uh, using buybacks to distribute in the short term in ways that you won't have to like reverse a, a dividend increase 
uh, is a very good way to, you know, to, to be able to distribute those cyclical cash flows. Now let's talk a little bit more about Fortuna Advisory. And so how are some of the ways that you guys provide insights for your clients? Yeah, so we work mostly with pretty large companies and we, we develop customized measures of performance that again, track growth, margin, uh, capital intensity. Our, our standard measure is called residual cash earnings. And then we work with the companies to weave that into you know, how they set goals, how they plan, how they allocate capital, how they make investment decisions, how they measure performance, and even, even how they provide incentive compensation uh, to, their, to their executives and managers to try to motivate them you know, to think and act more like an owner. Uh, that's really our ultimate goal is to get the executives of the company to think and act more like long-term committed owners. When they do so, they tend to deliver better performance for themselves, for all the stakeholders. Now let's uh, kind of a general question to end here is uh, what would be one tip that you could give a new investor out there that's just starting? I know that you have history here. And so how should they approach maybe investing for the first time? Okay. Well, I think you want to look for companies that you believe have some kind of differentiation, some kind of thing they do better than their competition. That's usually what it takes in order to be able to produce returns on capital above the cost of capital. And so finding companies that seem attractive to you in terms of their, their business model, their, their, their business is the first step. And then you want to look at their performance and their valuation. I think uh, new investors tend to look for good companies, which is good, but they don't always look at whether or not the company is trading at a good price. And so you know, take a look at EBITDA multiples, earnings multiples, you know, the usual sort of valuation indicators, compare them to other companies and in a similar industry or other companies growing at some similar rates to the to the one you're looking at and use that as a guide as to whether the company is cheap or not. And my last uh, point would be recognize that sometimes the market's high and, you know, sort of everybody has a high multiple and sometimes the market's low, everybody has a low multiple, you know, try to deploy capital into areas that, you know, are maybe a little out of favor at times, areas where the valuation multiples might be lower than the rest of the market. If you do that systematically over time, you'll be building a, a strong portfolio. Love that. Love that approach. And it definitely it's all about the time frame that you have. And I love how you give in there. Sometimes maybe the out of favor things in the long run can get you back probably the most return. And so thank you for coming on today. Greg Milano, CEO of Fortuna Advisors. We'll definitely have you back on and keep watch on those buybacks. Thanks for having me, Mitch. All right. There you guys have it. Second interview today. We're going to keep diving through here. It's 154. We got about six minutes left for the show. I'm here to go ahead and get through all the headlines and keep us in the informational edge. So let's go ahead. Let's dive on in. There's some earnings reports that we needed to roll through. Let's go through them. I'm going to try to go really quickly. If you guys got any of these that catch your eyes, or maybe there's a mover out there that's moving right now, throw it up in the chat right there. Say hello. I see a lot of new faces out there. Tell me a stock that's on your mind, and I'll make sure that I cover it. Let's go to NBAX here. NBAX earnings, of course, we talked about how uh, this really started bringing the biotechs down here. Let's take a quick look. NBAX, you guys can see how it went down. It was down about 30% here in pre-market, and about, about the same where it is right now uh, from yesterday's close. EPS at a loss of $6.53 down from Four dollars and seventy-five cent year over year, and these were lost. Um, so sales of one hundred and eighty-five point nine three million down from two hundred ninety-eight point two million year over year. Full year twenty-two guidance lowered on, of course, guidance due to poor demand of its COVID vaccines. I think this one's kind of an obvious one. Just late to the party with the vaccines, and because of that, the demand is lower. Majority of people that have gotten the vaccines, I think, have already done so. And so I don't think they're going to get a massive move for demand of its COVID vaccine, but we'll see what happens. Let's go to the upstart next. UPST, let's take a look at upstart holdings. I miss here at one cent, missing the 10 cent estimate sales at 228.16, missing the 241 uh, 0.63 million estimate. What was really a change and what knocked down this stock big was when they gave, of course, their revenue Q3 outlook. They lowered it to 170 million versus 248.92 million estimated. A huge change in revenue there for the Q3 is going to bring the stock down also. 
Let's keep going towards the gaming industry. Let's take a look at Take Two, TTWO. You guys can see there, it's trying to come back a little bit. We'll see what happens with this one. EPS coming at 71 cents, missing the 91 cent estimate. Sales at 1.00 billion, missing the 1.06 billion estimate. And of course, one thing that I think this one kind of gave a foretelling tale was that NVIDIA, NVIDIA kind of gave us a, a little bit of a, this talk. It said that gaming was the reason why it was going down there and pre-announcing. And so take two, also taking a little bit of a dip there. We'll see what happens there and take two interactive. I'm going to keep going. Let's take a look at, of course, let's go towards Norwegian Cruise Lines. I think uh, NCLH, we take a look there, and you guys can see it continued down and dropping big from kind of yesterday, from 1358 towards where it opened, about 8% down there. Uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines coming in here at a miss here. Um, they missed here 10 cent loss, missing the 9 cent loss estimate sales at 1136 million beating the 103.88 million oh hold on wrong one there apologize there reading the wrong line there eps here at a loss of a dollar and 14 cents missing the loss of 86 cent estimate sales at 1.2 billion missing the 1.26 billion estimate so deeper loss there in the eps sales missing also not what you wanted to see in the cruising industry, of course, is also knocking CCL down, RCL. And so they're coming back down to the kind of these levels where they were really starting to get a little bit of worry. We'll see what happens on CCL. Does it come back towards that 850? Definitely turned around from that $10. All right. The last one I want to talk about is Hims and Hers. It's that Hims is the stock. Uh, Hims and Hers coming on down here after it popped in the after hours, it had a loss of 10 cents, missing the loss of nine cent estimate sales at 113.6 million, beating the 103.88 million estimate. They did raise their full year sales guidance to 470 million on the low end, 485 million on the high end versus the 422.77 million estimate. So not a bad raise there of the sales guidance, higher than the estimate and Kind of interesting to see them pull back today, even though they had good earning report. But that's just how this market is. If you try to use logic, we've talked about it. It's very difficult to trade with logic in the markets. There are going to be times where the market reacts really logically. And there's going to be times where even if you think that this is the logical move, it's not going to follow. It's going to actually follow illogic there. And reason why is because it's just like that. The market always has some other factors affecting it. Sometimes even though you think that, hey, a miss and a miss should mean that the stock goes down, the stock comes back up because of the environment we're in. So you always need to understand that there's multiple factors always affecting these stocks. It's not just what you see on the tape there. All right, that's going to do it for us. I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. This is Stock Market Movers, where we talk about all the headlines on out there in the market. And of course, get to the expert opinions that you want to hear from. We had a great show today, so feel free to go ahead and rewind to check out some of the topics. Tech dropped Microsoft uh, and uh, Microsoft, Micron and NVIDIA. CPI report is the focus. Unity app loving. Ford, Arc, Kathy Wood buys the dip, of course, and backs dipping there. Earnings disappointments and upstart take two and Norwegian cruise lines. We were able to get through all the topics. I hope that you guys enjoyed rushing on through all this in one hour and getting to some expert opinions. Thank you for Adam Johnson and Greg Milano, CEO of Fortuna Advisors. So check out those interviews. If by any reason you missed out those interviews today, we'll get you guys on over to none other than the roadmap coming on next. So hit the thumbs on up and come on over to the roadmap with Chris Ketchy as he looks into the trends that are still making some money 
in NFTs. I'll see you guys next time. Hit the like before you get on out of here. Do me the favor, guys. Support me as I support you guys trying to get towards the best experts out there to keep us in the informational edge. That's why I bring on guys like Adam Johnson and Greg Milano here today is because it's all about keeping you guys in the information no ads so hit that like and like always we'll see what happens like always hit the subscribe bell if you're not subscribed and let's bring you guys on over to the roadmap action we'll see you a little bit later on at the close let's go let's go sound that alarm and we'll see you guys in the roadmap action i need to see what's going on in the nft environment right now